here in the lovely town of Paducah with 2K Productions. And I have the privilege and the honor of sitting with somebody that wants to revolutionize the world and truly has plans to make it happen. You know, a lot of us talk about wanting to make some changes and talk about ways things can get better. But I am sitting here with a gentleman that has plans and details on how it can happen. And he's right here in our backyard. So I want to make sure everybody hears the story from Mr. Herbert Martin. Mr. Martin, how are you doing today? I'm doing very well. Thank you very much. Thank you for having me. Oh, no problem. Thank you for allowing us to sit here and help you get your message to where it needs to be because you have a very valuable message. You've done a bunch of great things. I have a list of things that uh, that I know that you've done, and I'm sure there's some things that I don't know. And you can see all of his work here, and I don't know anything about it. And uh, you're going to explain it to us. You're going to give us some lessons. You're going to help us put together a strategy where we can all work together to to create change, to save the planet, because, um, well, you had mentioned it earlier, but there are a bunch of crises that are going on, and you have the tools and you have the ability to help change those crises, so we need to get this information to where it needs to get, so I'm glad you're allowed us to to sit here and pick your brain and share the knowledge that you have. So before we get into everything, uh, people see the gray in my face, they see a little bit of yours, not as much. <laughs> but can you tell everybody uh, your name and you can tell your age if you want to or how long you've been working in the in the, in the the environment? Hey, my name's Herbert Martin and uh, I'm 85 years old, and I'm proud of that, so I'm old enough to be your father. You don't look 85, so. Well, I, uh, I've done a lot of things in my life. I've worked for three architectural firms in Chicago as a designer and illustrator. Three, and I uh, was a curriculum specialist on the faculty at the University of Kentucky. I taught at vocational school, Paducah Tillman Vocational School in Paducah. I taught at Kentucky State University. You're, this isn't something that is brand new. No, no. This not. is something that, yeah, you just now thought about. This is something that... But, no, this is not brand new. I, I've, I've been working on projects in, all my life, really. I, when, as I mentioned to you earlier, I entered the Fisher Body Craftsman's Guild when I was in high school. And somebody kind of lifted my design for my car and, and manufactured a car that looked almost exactly like the one I designed. I, uh, but I entered the Latham Foundation International Poster Contest, and I won third place in that when I was in high school. I, I did a lot of things, but I came up with my first idea for an invention back when I was probably 18. And I designed a, a steak cold beer mug. A steak cold beer mug. A steak cold beer mug. And at eighteen, and were you even able to drink? Drinking, where you supposed to be? I wasn't drinking that, but I was getting ready to pledge fraternity, and I thought, well, fraternities drink with a mug, and I was designing a mug that looked like a, st a beer stein, uh -huh. and it turned out to be a steak cold glass or a mug yeah. or a cup or anything, any beverage. Uh -huh. And that was when I was maybe 18 years old. I've done a lot of Whatever things. was that? Did, did, I, did started, that I, I, made, I never, I've got a, a, a model of one at home that uh -huh. I made, but I never, Some somebody wrote to me a couple of weeks ago saying, what are you going to do with your steak home uh, glass? And uh, I haven't done anything with it. Unfortunately, that's the story of my life. Come up with great ideas, but I can't seem to get them going. But uh, in the meantime, I, you know, I've done a lot of artwork. I've written and illustrated three children's stories. I've written several full-length novels. Uh, in fact, and I did. I've done paintings relative to those to uh, some stories of uh, Miss uh, Patricia McKissick, who lived, used to live in St. Louis. She and I did together. She passed away as soon as she finished writing her portion of the book. 
book that we were working on. But that, my life has been full, and I'm grateful for that. But primarily, I'm interested in saving the world from the catastrophes that we're in, involved in right now. Now, when I first saw the first rocket ship blast into space, in my mind, I thought damage is being done. And in my mind, I thought- How old were you at that time? I was probably 24, 25. Okay. Uh, whenever the first rocket ship went up. <clears throat> and um, I thought they should be slipping through into the atmosphere instead of burning their way into the atmosphere. That's what I thought when I first saw that. Explain that, give it, because I'm that's a little well, bit over the bald head that I have, and I'm sure there's a lot of people that would want to know the sort of difference. Well, at, at, I realized at the time that the rocket ships burning their fossil fuels as they were and going through the ozone layer, I knew that they were doing damage to our atmosphere out there and doing, ultimately, doing harm to the world. Now, it turns out that not only are the rocket ships doing that damage, but jet planes flying in heights higher than eight miles up are burning off the ozone. And everybody says today, oh, the ozone layer is being depleted. And everybody understands that that's the reason for the climate crisis we're having because the ozone is rapidly disappearing. And people say, oh, cow flatulence is causing the ozone to disappear. It's not. It's not. It's the progress that we made and I'm not against progress, but it's a progress the space race in burning off the ozone. Ozone is O3. Oxygen is O2. Oxygen is needed to burn anything. So uh, yes. obviously we can see a rocket ship blast passing through the ozone is going to do some harm. Now, the other thing that we can say is ozone, the atomic number for ozone is less than the atomic number for methane. So therefore, ozone is lighter than methane, and therefore, the layer of ozone is higher than the layer of methane. Mm -hmm. so, so if a cow is- And methane being the flatulence from the cow. From the cow. Yes. Yeah, so how's it gonna get up there? If it's not as strong or if the, yeah, so. Yeah, absolutely. So that's thinking in that manner, We what we have to do is revolutionize not only our energy system where we're generating electricity using fossil fuels, destroying the, the coal and the oil on our, our aerospace, on, on our, our transportation, uh, airplane transportation, all of those things. We're, we're destroying coal, using up coal, using up oil, and, and not putting it to good use. Now, what I have in mind is to replicate all of those services, but not use any fossil fuels and not use up any of the natural resources that are here on Earth. That's what I want to do. A couple of questions about that. I'm pretty sure there's some industries that that would upset. Absolutely. Are you prepared for either the shutdown or backlash or the naysayers that come from those high dollar industries that would not want to see a, a change in their bottom lines? What I, what I want to do is to work with industry to make change. Now, what I'm proposing will create just as many new jobs as the jobs that will be phased out as we go through these things. And I will explain all of those things when I, when I explain my concepts behind generating electricity without using fossil fuels. That's one thing. I have an invention for that. I got a patent last year for a solar tracking device that can track the sun and generate electricity. Now I'm gonna now I'm gonna explain all these things to you because I'm 85 and I've had a good life. And why should I sit on good concepts thinking, oh I gotta save these and, and because somebody else will 
I want people to be able to use my concepts. It's best that we can use this forum to get that out there yes. and to help create the change, which leads me to my second question that I had along these lines. Who have you talked to about this? What who have you who who have you talked to and what resistance have you gotten? Okay, I have written a prospectus explaining my concepts and I've been in touch with at least 50 or 60 wealthy people, politicians, people who get up, jumping up and down saying, oh, we want to do this for the climate. I've been in touch with everyone and nobody writes me back. I, I can't say why. Okay, I, I had a meeting. I called the Tennessee Valley Authority and we set up a meeting with four of the engineers with DVA. And I'm going to explain the concept that I that I shared with them. And they those four engineers were duly impressed. And they said, golly, how did you think of this? But they went away and I never heard back from DVA. Now, is DVA in the cold pocket? Or who, whose pocket are they in that they wouldn't contact me back to say, Wow. Let's let's run this rabbit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I and I don't know. But let me let me explain that concept that I did uh, I shared with Please you. Please do. Okay, this is the invention that I got a patent on and we're in, in the McCrack County Library and the reason we're here and we're grateful for them for letting us use their facility to, to film this. But the reason we're here is because they wanted a display of my work in the foyer, and they have copies of my five inventions in the foyer. They also have copies of all kinds of other stuff, paint, some of my paintings, and, and, and we can look at those before we leave. But this first invention that I'm talking about is a solar tracking device, and I this device can track the sun. No matter where the sun is, it will turn and face the sun. And then once it faces the sun, and, and everybody's seen the disc that for television and all that sort of thing. This, this is a parabolic dish. Just, uh, it's a parabolic reflector, just as you, you have it in, in your television this. Now, the beauty of this is on top of here is just a circle. And I'm going to draw, draw some of this stuff if you don't mind. That's just a dome. And that dome is divided into to four separate segments. Now these segments right here, that's the dome. These segments are photovoltaic cells. And that's just, just a regular ball. You cut a ball in half, that's what you got on the top side. Yeah. Okay. Now, when the sun rays, no matter where they're coming from, when they come and hit these photovoltaic cells, each one of those cells will generate a greater amount of electricity than the other. One will generate the most, one will generate the least amount of electricity. Now, we have uh, devices that can read the voltage, a voltage meter, a voltage regulator. The electricity from that goes to the voltage meter, it says this this photovoltaic cell is receiving more electricity than one on the opposite side. Okay, with that in mind, the whole unit will turn based on the, the volt, voltage meter and the voltage regulator saying this side needs to get more electricity because this side has the most. And then we'll send it. Takes. Yeah, so what happens is it sends the electricity 
from here down to these rollers on this spear down here. And the voltage regulator says how much each one is getting, and, and it turns the whole apparatus so that it, no matter where the sun is, these things want to be equal. So regardless of where the sun is, it's maximizing, it's rotating. Rotating, so that each one of... So each cell can get a little bit more sun. Each cell has the exact same amount of sun as the other cell. That's the concept. So it turns based upon that concept right there. Now, what happens is, once it turns the face at, then, I don't know if you can see this or not, but, the whole parabolic dish is facing the sun. The sun's rays then, The sun's rays are bouncing off of the reflective surface of the parabolic reflector, and they are going to the focal point of, of the parabola. Okay, how, how does that work? You got a parabola here, sun's rays are coming, striking that, and they're going to the focal point. There's a focus right here. So every ray that hits this coming back to that focal point. Now, the beauty of this is once this is facing the sun, then the underside of, and that's, that's this, this drawing here, the underside of, of the disc up here is a part of an ellipse. Now, every ellipse has four focal points. Now, if it's a narrow ellipse, two of the two foci are outside the ellipse, but and two are always going to be inside. If it's a, a fat ellipse, then both all four will be inside. Now, I've been called a fat ellipse before. <laughs> okay, thank goodness I haven't yet. But if you, if you draw, you can trace an ellipse and say every reflecting point on the ellipse goes from this focus and, and bounces back to that focus. Every point goes from one focus to the other. That's the concept that we want to use here because once we've got the, the ellipse, we say that focal point on the top half of the ellipse is being shared with the focal point on the, the parabola. The parabolic disc and the top half of the ellipse share a focal point. Now, so that all of the sun's rays are coming and bouncing off of the ellipse, going through this focal point and passing through it and hitting top half of that ellipse. Once they do that, when they hit the top half of the ellipse, they go down and I have them coming so they come all the way through this. I don't see all, and they're coming down and converging at the second focal point of the ellipse. Now, why is the beauty of that? What this does is, all of these sun rays for the ellipse come here, bounce back, and they all are on this one spot right there. Now, what happens to that spot? That spot gets as hot, as hot as as all of the surface. I was going to say that that spot gets that's hot. That's a though. hot spot. <laughs> that hot, that's a that hot that spot can get up to ten thousand degrees. It's hot. It's hot. It can get up to 10,000 degrees Fahrenheit or more. So, as the bigger the ellipse, the hotter the spot is going to be. So that's the whole concept now. And that hot spot is energy, it's just the ball that's of just energy. Concentrated energy. And so therefore we can we can use well-known theory of 
the steam engine, which has been around forever. We take that hot spot and you'll see that's that's how it's formed there. But what happens is the hot spot is on here. Now if we have water, the source of water coming in, it's heating the water up. Heating that water up to superheated steam based upon the heat of that hot spot. Now superheated steam comes out. And what does that superheated steam do? Superheated steam has the power to turn turbine. a turbine or any steam engine. Or, now, what are we doing? We're using that superheated steam to generate electricity because just like we would ordinarily generate electricity using coal at, at a generating plant. All it's doing is, is heating up steam, turning up the generator because you know that Generate magnetic generators are such that if, if you take a magnet and you know a magnet has a positive and negative poles, you know that copper wire, the electron on the outside is is a negative charge. The elect electron. If you move a magnet along that wire. You remember opposites attract? Yes. Okay. And if you move in this magnet along the wire, the, the negative electrons, as this gets closer, they're going to move away from it. But the negative electrons on this side will be moving toward the positive end of it. That's, that's the whole concept of a, a generator. You're causing electrons to flow through a wire to, to generate electricity. That's, that's the whole thing. Well, what we've done here is we've taken superheated steam, forcing our electrons to move through and, and generate electricity. Now, we know now that this concept works. What are we doing? With this concept, we're saving all that coal because we can utilize all of the existing generating plants all over the world. And instead of burning the coal to generate the electricity, we can, we can even use the exact same generators. All we're doing is replacing the, the, the steam, the superheated steam from coal. We're replacing it with superheated steam from the sun. Now, when you said the the it'll track the sun, is it what about and this is my lack of knowledge. Uh, what about a cloudy day? Okay, that, I'm glad you asked. <laughs> on a cloudy day, on a cloudy day, we're gonna we're gonna replace all of the, the, the generators all over the world. Okay, at nighttime, how are we gonna get electricity? Okay, on a cloudy day, how are we gonna get electricity? See all those things. That that if you take a look at any generating plant, it's got all those big old smokestacks. Yeah. All going all the way up in there. We're gonna take those smokestacks and convert those into water stacks. So during the daytime, when the sun is shining and we got all the electricity, we're gonna pump water into existing smokestacks, we'll make them waterproof and all that stuff, and fill them with water. Now at night and on cloudy days, that water, the, the water pressure from that will force, can force a gate open. This gate will bring water out of that and we turn the generators from a solar power generator, we turn those into hydropower generators. So we have what we, uh, a system that we can call solar hydromagnetic generating plants. And all of these, and if we don't have one, we can build a, a water stack. But all of them already have stacks going up, you know, 500 feet in the air. Yeah. So, 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 
So we can water them, and suddenly we have solar, hydro, magnetic generating system all over the world. And we don't, but in addition to that, we know we've got a grid. So if we want international cooperation, then we can say we can share the grid. We can get, okay, the, up at, uh, going from Alaska to Russia that, that some lady running for yeah, president can look sure. across 15, yeah. all it is is 15 miles. We can have a good relationship with Russia and transport electricity across the 15 miles when it gets dark over there and it's light in New York. We can share electricity, all have a worldwide grid rather than having just a nationwide grid. Just a nationwide grid. Yeah. So I mean there are ways, but the water is one way we can be sure to, to say if here for doing <coughs> We want 24 hour electricity. We have solar power in the daytime, hydro power at night. Okay. Is for my solar hydro power generating system. But what I want to show you is I have a I'm going somewhere here. Anyway, what I was going to say is, uh, we don't have to confine ourselves to just one of, of these solar photovoltaic cells, solar power systems. We can say we can put a disc, a whole series of discs, <coughs> and put them in series. For that matter, if we need that much more electricity, instead of one parabolic this we can have 15 or 20. Have you done a study on the size per city? I know that's super technical, but how big of one, how big of a device would we need to power Paducah? Okay. If that's, a, if, if that, if, if no, that's. No, no, that, that's, that's a reasonable question. You can have one giant system or you can have a whole but the small ones. Small ones in series. So whatever you need, you can tack on and add on to it to, to get where you need to be. So theoretically, for a business, which came from, I'm going to be saying this too. For a business, this could be privately owned per household or per family, and they could generate their own sort of Electricity to be yeah. okay. I'm glad you brought that up because the beauty of this is a farmer who's pioneering some land out somewhere can set up his own system of electrical power right there on the farm. All he's got to do is be near some water. Provide power for the villages over there, which may not have some. We can set those things up and and power a whole village and share share power with everybody in the village like that. So how how far or what what's the could this be built today? Yeah, this system could be built today. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. Would be the we have enough. Okay, at this point. About photoelectric cells and and generating so that we uh, and in fact they even have paint up you can paint something and create photoelectric generation out with that but right now if you take a look at all those solar farms they just got stationary solar panels yes and and they're inefficient but they are generating a lot of of electricity, but you have required acreage. This device right here, one of these things, turn the space of sun to 
focuses that. You don't need all that hate to be utilizing all that acreage. Now, I'm not trying to put the, the solar panels out of business, but at the same time, we have to be efficient. If you need more land, you got to put solar panels on the land or grow food on the land. Yeah, so, that's true. Yeah. So, what industries, what agencies, and let's find a camera for you to make sure you talk to. I want you to talk to the people that need to hear this, the people that can make the change so we can do what we can do. Because in my limited understanding of all things engineering, I understood this and it made sense. And if it can happen, then it doesn't seem to me like there's a reason why this should not be examined by some government agency, some environmental agency, some millionaire that or billionaire that wants to make a change, somebody. And we are going to put this out there so we can see what we can do. So talk to Well let me let me let me I wanna continue okay. with my concepts okay. before we, we get into who because I, I, I I'm saying the Biden administration is wonderful in Congress because you know last year they uh, passed a bill authorizing seven hundred and fifty billion dollars for the climate crisis. I have not heard that bill. Yeah, and and they're and every day almost somebody's coming up with the need for something to combat the climate crisis. Now you know that if we can utilize these things in and, and stop all of the, the generating plants from using fossil fuels. Not only does it save the Earth's resources, which are going up in smoke, but that smoke that's going up there is causing the pollution. More damage on the... Causing pollution. So that in itself is one reason why we should be able to reach some of that uh, climate crisis money, the funds, because we would stop polluting the atmosphere. But I have other you know, other ways, and I'm, I'm going to explain those to you right Let's now. Let's hear them. In, in, in order to do that, I'm going to take these down. All right. And I'm going to put up something else. You need to leave this one there. You can leave that one there. That's okay. good. Yeah. Oh, this was that. One in series that I was looking for. These are all just parabolic dishes. Oh, okay. House on top of a building. In on top of a platform. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You got the dome, the water supply, parabolic dish, collectors in series, and every everything you need to generate electricity. Okay. Now I want to explain something else to you. I'm going to put this up here. Can you see that? When, when I was watching the spaceship burn up off the ozone back when I was a young guy, I first had the concept for a fine saucer. I refused to call it a flying saucer because I thought that people would say I was some kind of cool. For, and then especially now, not, myself, not, not so, much, so much, but there's still some people that not would so much, but back probably then, echo certain sentiments. Yeah, they would say, what a cool. But I dreamed of a, of a flying saucer that could slip through the atmosphere. And that's when I came up with the design for this. Now, I got a patent. On, on this back in 2012 but I, I first thought of the concept back in 1967 68 this is a flying saucer and, and what happens with this is that the outer portion of this Rotates around just like a frisbee. It, it's it's got these flaps in there, 
and the flaps help create lift. But the outside, you know, a frisbee is, is a very stable uh, configuration. When I was a boy, uh, my mother, one of her friends, bought me a gyroscope. I was really fascinated by the gyroscope. And so I thought uh, a flying saucer based on the concept of the gyroscope would really be the way to go. And then I thought, well, that's kind of like a frisbee too. So the outer ring here rotates and creates a gyroscopic effect that stabilizes the whole thing. Now, it, it has lift not only because these things are, are going around and, and have the flaps there, but it also has lift because it's got these air holes, intake air holes going around. Okay. In order to, to have the air holes to work, I devised a system, and this is my concept, I created what I, I chose to, to call a sinusoidal ring. Now, if you stop and think about a sine wave, a sine wave goes like that. And if I were to put a roller on the top of that sine wave and let it roll around there, and, and say, okay, there's a piston up here. Then the, that piston would be going up and down. Okay. okay, now, suppose I said, I'm gonna take a, a, a flat ring, and Cut that sine wave out of that ring. So it's going around and around and going around the whole circle like that. Well, that's what we've got right here. A sinusoidal ring where the top part of the ring has been cut out and the bottom part of the ring forms as it's the top part is going away, the bottom part is a solid with a sine wave running around it, and it's in a circular motion. As that goes around like that, these pistons can go up and down, up and down, as, as the ring is turning. Independently or all the same? Or no, they're, they're, going, they're based on the height where of the, the sinusoidal ring at that time. Okay. One will go up and the other one's halfway up and they, you know, and they're doing this. Gotcha. Okay. Going around okay. like that. So, they're going around. They're sucking air into these little holes on top of here. And what I have is, let me take a look at this like this. That's a hole there. When the piston sucks air in, there's, that's the cross section. From the, the, the sinusoidal ring right here, and it, it's hooked into the base of the piston, and as it's going around, the piston is moving up and down like that. It's pulling air in, and that air goes into a compression chamber there. Now, we have compressed air so that once we use the flaps here for lift, we're also using compressed air to live. So we can say the compression going down lifts the whole flying saucer. So we have com compression and flaps for lift. <coughs> now once, once and, and the whole thing is turning and being stabilized but by the gyroscopic effect of the um, craft. Now, once once this craft gets aloft and gets up so high, or say if it's out of the uh, atmosphere, Earth's atmosphere, this can be stopped and the 
all systems stopped and just be one flying disc that that uh, let the chosen and compressed uh, air in there. But all the time, while that's being stopped like that, it, it still can be pulling air in to the, to the portals on the top side. Now, what I have here, shown there, those are things right there. Those are little uh, clear uh, plexiglass domes for my first, this last invention, the, the solar tracking device. These things that can track the sun here, create the superheated steam, and as that superheated steam is going through the, uh, going against the, these fins right here, that's what's turning the whole outer ring. So I was wondering if they were going to connect somehow. Yeah, so so what we're saying is we got a, a, a flying device here that is being powered by the sun. So it's not using any diesel fuel, not using any any type of fuel. All it's using is solar power and water to fly. So how do you how do you how do you fix it so somebody can fly in it? How would okay, you? well here's the thing. This part here is the fixed part for the power. But you can make the outer part around here as spacious as you want. So you can create seating space for passengers and then this part up here, that's that's all in hollow right there. So a dome going over that. Would, and I guess the gyroscopic effect would keep the inside from... Yeah, but from, from moving, yeah. the gyroscope stabilizes it and then the compressed air pushes it forward, up, down, back. It can, it can, can turn on an axis if it wants to, or if with with thrust in any direction, it can go this way, that way, any direction you want to, based upon which one is of the thrusters. See, which one of the thrusters that you open up to to let the compressed air push it in some some direction. Now that's super compression in there, so it has to be very strong. But uh, the, the, the sinus oil ring sucks in this. The solar power turns the whole thing to create the sinus oil ring, bringing uh, the, the compressed area. And you, you, only fuel you have to have on on board for that is just water. So now, think about what's what's happening. You're you're flying commercial aircraft using no no carbon fuels whatsoever, no fossil fuels. So could that be? Would what would be required to pilot that? Would it be, take a special pilot's license? Would it take, would it be totally different than flying a plane? Or are you getting into some area? It, it, it would be different from flying a plane, yeah. Yeah, certainly different. And I'm sure it would, would, would require some hours of study. And this is not the final product. This yeah. is just my patented concept. I have a patent on this flying saucer. Could that be made today? Yes, yes, it could be made today. This is patent, U.S. patent 8,322,649 B2. That's a patent that I have on this flying saucer, and it could be made today. Yeah. And, it, and the thing is, it can be made as large as you want. So, like, it could be made as big as a city block, for that matter, or it could be made as small. It could be made just like uh, uh, the uh, little devices now that they use floating around, taking the, the drones. The drones, yeah. Have you ever thought about? Uh, they, they approach it toy companies? I would post a toy company. Oh. I, I had a concept for a toy that, a board game, and I looked up one Christmas. I got a there. And my 
looked at somebody close to my 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 board game was going to be called Spellexical Perplexical, and it was going to be where you use your mind to figure out stuff and, and something similar to it. So anyway, we won't get into that. Um, but this is the flying saucer. Now, what's what's the beauty of the flying saucer? First of all, the fact that it's using only solar power and water is is wonderful. And if it uses up all the water on board, it can up it's up there, it can dip into the clouds and refuel the water by just sucking water into into these portals that are coming down. But the real beauty of it is when you when you look at this, it's generating electricity from this because the whole the whole thing is turning. Well, it's turning because the vents are here pushing that whole outer ring is turning. This is fixed here. Now, the electricity is being generated in the fixed portion, but in order to get electricity out to the rotating section, you have to have a, a, a system of brushes. And so, I got the, the, the brushes drawn somewhere here. Oh, here we are, brushes, right here. So the brushes are taking electricity. The copper coils are here, the brushes are, are, are here. When, when electricity is passed through brushes, it, brushes are here, it's going past. Mm -hmm. These are just little watt, copper fibers that are brushing up against other copper as it's moving past. And the electricity going through these is transferred then to the outer ring. But when electricity passes through brushes, it creates ozone. The earth is trying to repair itself where we're destroying it. Every time lightning flashes, ozone is created. And, that's, and, and we're getting more and more ozone being created every day because lightning is worse now than it was when you were a boy. I don't really? Know. Yeah. Well, but, I didn't know that. But, but the thing, but when, when the brushes are, are brushing up against the copper, it creates ozone. Now, I can put one of these gadgets, one of these flying saucers, up and put them up in the, in the atmosphere, and that will just create ozone. They can stay up there forever, replenish all the water in the cloud. And, and make ozone and replace the ozone layer, and that would, would start to, to reverse the climate crisis that we're having right now. And this would be the most effective way for space travel to slip through the cloud, slip through the ozone. You can go. I, I always said that if I wanted to inhabit the moon, I could set one of these things down on the moon, seal off outer ring, this whole portion could be made from clear fiberglass and, and yeah. titan titanium mesh to, to give it the strength. Lightweight, titanium mesh, sun can come through it, plant some vegetables up. I'm a vegetarian, by the way. Plant some vegetables up on Mars and now I have something to eat while I was there. So, and seal up around here. Now, you got water Water on board, H2O. You need some oxygen. Oh, yeah. yeah, you need to drink the water and you need to create some, extra, some more oxygen. Mm -hmm. And you're creating carbon dioxide for the plants. So, I mean, it's self sustaining. Yeah, self sustaining. Okay, but anyway, that that pretty much covers what I wanted to say. Awesome. So, um, find the camera and Call let's it. talk about the industries, the agencies. He needs to hear this so we'll know who we can uh, bug and continue saying, hey, look at this, look at this, look at this. And then if they don't, who can we blame and say, hey, Mr. Martin had some great ideas, but we failed to follow up. There are globally calls to say, how can we solve the climate crisis that we're having? Talk, we need to get in touch with the Secretary General of the 
the United Nations Protection Agency. We need love. We need to get in touch with people in the from the in Congress and in the Biden administration to say to say how can we solve provided money, give us the money to develop the things that we know can help save the world. You know, that's where we need to go. Congress and in the Biden administration. I was from anybody because, you know, I get my age. Hey, I just want to do some good out the world. The things that we know can help save the world. But that's where we need to go. Okay. Uh, now, if someone with tons and tons of money wants to come and, and join us, hey, I was from anybody because, you know, I get my age. Hey, I just want to do some good for the world. Let's do it. Exactly. And I certainly appreciate you talking with us about that. I had some questions written down, but I don't know if you read my card when I had my back turned, but you answered all the questions that I had and plus broke this down where it's easy for somebody to understand that doesn't have an extremely technical background. So I don't have any other questions. I certainly appreciate your time. I appreciate the work that you're doing. I want everybody watching this to understand that, like Mr. Martin said, we are in a global crisis and it doesn't seem like there's enough being done. And some of these simple concepts, and I say simple, but the way he explained them was easy for me to understand, but these concepts are able to be done. They are feasible. They are renewable. They are necessary, and we have a person that can get them done. So let's get these things done. Let's change the planet. Let's make sure that not only are we looking out for our lives, but our future generations have either a planet or they have an escape from a planet. How about that? That's a good idea. Thank you so much. Thank you.